In the past, we've taken a look at logic components before. We know what all the components are, we know how they work, and we have the idea that, you know, we can string them together in a circuit for it to sort of behave in a way we want. But we never really went into the specifics of actually designing a good circuit. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at one aspect of that. We're going to be taking a look at a nifty tool called Carnock Maps, and we'll try to see how it can actually help us in circuit design. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So, to first give credit where credit is due, I'd like to thank my professors from the Computer Organization course at the National University of Singapore. I learned a lot of the things that I'm going to be presenting to you today from my course at school. So yeah, thank you very much to the teaching team. Let's begin by first taking a closer look at circuit design. Now, as it turns out, there are sort of two different ways, two different directions of thought you could take to actually create a circuit. The first of the two methods is what I would call working forwards, where basically you have a task in mind and you break it down into little logical steps. Then you pick you know, the appropriate gates or components that can fulfill these steps and you build your circuit based on that idea. I'm sure you can picture why I call that working forward because essentially you have an idea and you build it. The alternative to that is of course working backward. Instead of thinking about how you want to solve your problem, you just think about the solution. You jump straight to the end and basically decide on what kind of outputs you want your system to produce given what sort of inputs. Given the results, you work backwards and you basically think about you know, how you want to solve the problem based on the results you want. Today, we're going to be focusing on the latter, the working backwards method of creating a logic circuit. We're going to look at the difficulties such a method actually presents to us and how we can actually overcome them. But before we begin with that, we first need to look at, you know, some of the language we're going to be using to express our problems. In the past, when we looked at logic, we looked at it in terms of true and false. We looked at it in terms of gates. But today, we're going to be looking at it in terms of Boolean algebra, which is the normal language we actually use when talking about Carnot maps. Now, here's the deal. It might sound a little bit scary, you know, anything with algebra in a name could sound kind of scary, but don't worry, this is actually exactly the same as what you already know. It's just a different language to express the exact same idea. In fact, there is a direct mapping between, you know, the gates you are familiar with and Boolean algebra. So yeah, let's take a look at that. So for the purpose of this particular video, well, we really only need to focus on three key gates. And well, the first of which is your NOT gate. Now, as you can very quickly recall, your NOT gate is simply an inversion of, you know, whatever the input is. And in Boolean algebra, we actually represent it with the prime symbol. So instead of saying NOT x, we simply say x prime, and it means the same thing. Next up, there is also the N symbol. And essentially, N is now represented as a multiplication. So instead of saying A and B, we can simply say a times b, or like what we normally do in math, simply say a b. Similarly, the OR gate can be represented as an addition, where a or b is actually represented as a plus b. Now, if you have a lot of trouble actually remembering this, then think of it this way. As you know, we can actually represent false as 0 and true as 1, and what that means is, really, the N operation is analogous to multiplication. This is when we actually look at just, you know, a normal multiplication of 1 and 0, and you realize that it behaves, you know, sort of the same way as the N gate does. If there is a 0 any time in your multiplication, you'll get 0. And the only time you'll get 1, in other words, the only time the N operation is true, is when you take 1 multiplied by 1. The OR operation is analogous in a similar way, any time there is an addition with 1, well, you're going to get 1 at the end. And if you actually take two ones and add them together, well, there's no way you can get 0, which is why we'll consider this true as well. This is exactly the same as how the OR gate actually behaves. 
So hopefully that wasn't too difficult. Let's now move on to actually looking at the basics behind the backwards method. So to actually do the backwards method, we're going to have to start off with this, a truth table. So what we do is we enumerate through all the possible inputs and we generate all the outputs that we want given the inputs. When we have this information, we can actually try and express it in terms of, well, how we would actually lay out circuits to fulfill these conditions. Let's just look at one of these entries first. For this particular entry, all the inputs have to be 1 to give you an output of 1. In other words, this can actually be represented as A and B and C. Or to put it in Boolean algebra, simply a multiplication of the three. On a similar vein, this one up here basically says that everything needs to be 0 to give you an output of 1. And therefore, this is simply A prime times B prime times C prime. In other words, we take an inversion of each one of the inputs and generate an output of 1. So repeat this same process for, you know, whenever the output is true. And what we get are a set of expressions. But how do we actually combine all these expressions to represent the entire truth table? Well, simple. We just stick all gates between each one of these expressions. In fact, we have just successfully designed our circuit and we can actually go ahead and build it. So this is the circuit itself built in Logisim, and right now the inputs, which are on the left, are all set to zero. As you can see, the output is one. And well, this actually represents the first line in our truth table. Let's actually go ahead and toggle up these values and basically see that, you know, the entire truth table is being fulfilled correctly. First, we toggle C to one, well, we get the output of 1, which is, you know, what we expect. With the input 0, 1, 0, we get an output of 0. Once again, we have 1 as expected, then 0 as expected, 0 again, then 1 for this, and 1 when all the inputs are 1. And therefore, what we've done is, well, by just working backwards, we have come up with a set of logic components that we can string together, to give us the output we want. As you can see, working backwards to create a circuit isn't all that difficult. But there is one problem. We are using a whole lot of logic gates. Not only is this wasteful, as it turns out, it is also unnecessary. Let's take a look at an example in the circuit we've just seen, where we can actually replace quite a few logic gates with just one or two. Let's focus our attention on the last two lines of the truth table. Now, notice what's going on here. We want to set the output to 1 if the inputs are 1, 1, 0, or if the inputs are 1, 1, 1. But you realize that we can actually simplify this greatly because, well, if you were to look at this from another perspective, really the input just needs to be A and B, and both have to actually be 1. The actual value of C given that we have this, is unimportant. In fact, C is actually redundant in this discussion. Its value doesn't matter. It could be 0, it could be 1. We still get a final output of 1 at the end. Therefore, this complex expression used to basically express what we've just described can be simplified greatly down to just A, B. Since C is redundant, we can leave it out entirely. In fact, as you can see, by actually simplifying that part of the circuit, we've saved ourselves so many gates. And yet, with A and B set to true, we get the output of 1. And it remains the same even if we were to toggle the value of C, like so. In fact, if you were to go back and take a closer look at the truth table, you realize that there are more things we can actually eliminate in a similar vein. So, what we would really like here is to have a tool that can help us easily identify these redundancies and sort of give us an idea of how to remove them. This is where Carnot maps come in. So let's begin by seeing the magic of a Carnot map. Essentially, a Carnot map is taking a truth table and sort of laying it out so that each cell actually represents the output given one particular set of inputs. Notice that when we actually lay out these values, we have to use the gray code. We've talked about gray code on, you know, the recent episode of Friday Minis. So if you haven't seen it, there will be an annotation link on screen. 
But yeah, this is not the usual ordering in which you, you know, normally represent numbers in. So do take notes. 1-1 one, one comes with 4-1-0. Once we have this, we can simply grab the actual truth table itself and populate this Karnok map. Of course, once again, remember that the values here, you know, at the end of the truth table, actually map to somewhere in the middle, thanks to the fact that we actually have all these labeled in grey code. The next thing we have to do is to actually identify groupings of all the ones. The whole point is, by actually creating groups like these, we can decide what to eliminate. And yeah, that's the whole point. We want to eliminate variables that don't matter. What do I mean by that? Well, given a simpler kind of map like this, well, we can actually perform a grouping like this. And what this tells us is, for this particular value of a and b, c actually doesn't matter, because it can be either value, it still belongs in this group. So that's the core idea behind actually finding groups within a Carnot map. Now, there are some intricacies behind, you know, deciding on what groups you can choose, what groups you cannot choose, which is why we're going to look at it as a set of rules. But while we are going through those rules, just always bear in mind the end goal of actually getting these groups in the first place, and that is to eliminate variables that don't matter. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Essentially, when we actually create groupings, there are a few important things we have to do. For example, the shape of our groups must be either rectangles or squares. What this means is we cannot actually group up something diagonally. At the same time, the size of each group must be a power of 2, and it must be maximized. In terms of the number of groups, we cannot have redundant groups, and at the same time, no value of 1 should actually be, you know, not covered by any group at all. Luckily, groups can overlap, and groups can actually wrap around the edges of the table. Now, this can be quite confusing, so let's take a look at a few simple examples. First, with just three ones like this, we could try to group them all together. Well, we can't, because, well, each group can only be a power of 2, and by that I mean 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. So yeah, maybe for this we can break it up like this. Well, no, not that either, because we want the groups to be as large as we can actually make them. Don't forget, overlapping is okay, and what this means is, the correct solution is to actually have two overlapping groups to select these three ones. What about something like this? You may be tempted to just create two groups like this, but that is incorrect, because, well, groups can actually wrap around the edges of the table. This is actually one contiguous group that wraps around the edge of the table, selecting all four ones at once. Yet another example here, well, we see we have three ones, this one isn't connected to these in any way, so yeah, we can just select this, right? No, remember that every single one must be covered. So well, what we actually need are two groups, this one in its own solitary group. That's fine, one is indeed a power of two. Here's another situation in which this is actually violated once again, there is a redundant group in here. You don't need that because it's entirely consumed by the group on the outside. So yeah, get rid of that. So yeah, hopefully this gives you a better idea of, you know, how we actually want to group up the ones in a Karnok map. However, once again, like I said earlier on, don't really think of it in terms of the rules. Think of it as, you know, the end goal you have in mind, and that is to eliminate as much as you possibly can. But at the same time, to actually not create groups that are not meaningful. So the reason why we cannot actually choose, say, a group of three, is because we cannot actually figure out what we want to eliminate when we make the selection. When we make a smaller selection like this, we'll see that, well, B can be either 0 or 1, it doesn't matter, and thus it can be eliminated. However, when we make a grouping of this size, we can no longer come to the same kind of conclusion and it doesn't tell us that we can actually eliminate anything. If you find it difficult to memorize the individual rules, then think of it within this logic. Anyway, enough about that, let's move on to our original problem here. So essentially, this is our Carnot map, these are our selections, and once the groupings have been made, we can simply make use of the groupings to give us the final equation. 
The first group tells us that C doesn't matter as long as A and B are zero. That's why we get this expression for the group in red. For the group in blue, what it's saying is that, well, B can be either zero or one, it doesn't matter as long as A is zero and C is one. And therefore this gives us this expression. Once again, for this, which is actually what we've tried to eliminate earlier on, well, as long as A and B are both one, C doesn't matter, giving us this expression. Once again, all we have to do is to sum it all up and that will give us our complete circuit. As you can see, the simplification actually really removes a lot of entries from, you know, the original equation. Let's actually build this and take a look. As you can see, this circuit looks so much simpler. Running through all the inputs, well, it's behaving as we would expect. So yeah, that's the beauty of a Carnot map. As you can see, it really simplified things by a whole lot. And there you go, that's how Carnot maps work in a nutshell. As you can imagine, this is not too hard to scale up to larger problems. Across the larger the grid, the more meticulous you're gonna have to be so that, you know, you find all the correct groupings. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna very quickly look at another example. And this example has two features of interest. First, well, it is larger, so there is sort of more room to work with things. And secondly, it actually has what are known as don't care values. Now, here's the deal. Sometimes when you're designing a circuit, you know, using the backwards method, you realize that there's certain combinations of inputs that either don't make sense or you will never encounter. As a result, you really don't care what the output is. Whether it's zero or one, it is not wrong. Normally in truth tables, we'll represent that as an X. And well, in our Carnot maps, we're gonna do the same. What's really cool about don't care conditions is that, well, it is up to us to choose whether it will be zero or one. And we can choose depending on what makes things more convenient for us. You'll see that when we actually, you know, work with the Carnot map later. So with that said, let us jump into figuring out a Carnot map for a four input circuit. Okay, so this is our more advanced example, including several don't care values over here. Let's make our selections here. As you can see, I have chosen to group these four values together. There is a long vertical piece of four inputs here, as well as another long horizontal piece, which includes a don't care value. Now, this will be a good time to actually show you that, well, Carnot maps are actually not unique. For example, I could make this selection instead of, you know, the vertical bar, and that works just fine. However, it would not be right to actually make a selection here, because, well, this selection is actually redundant. It doesn't actually include any new ones, and therefore we cannot pick that. Similarly, we also cannot pick just this. I mean, while we technically can, and while it's technically, you know, not an issue, it's just not optimized because we want our groups to be as large as possible and making a selection that looks like this would give us a larger group. So with that said, let's once again begin to actually break down our individual groups into equations. This group yields B prime C prime for the very simple reason that, well, in this case, A could be zero, A could be one, that's no problem. Just like how D could be zero, D could be one. What is fixed is B is zero in both these columns, and C is also zero in both these rows, and therefore, these have to be fixed. For this, it's easier to see because, well, we can see that both C and D are locked to one, but A and B are allowed to vary whatever way they like. Similarly, for this group, A and B is locked to one and zero, but C and D is allowed to freely vary, and as such, we leave them out. So this gives us our final equation. And just to show you that the two alternative Carnot maps work just the same, I'm going to derive the equation for the other one as well. I then put both expressions into Logisim, which generates the truth table for me. Notice that these truth tables are identical except for one row. Luckily for us, this is not a mistake. This is merely the don't care condition. Because the square for A, B, C, D prime is not grouped in a Carnot map on the left, it shows up as a zero for its truth table. 
It shows up as one for the map on the right, since we do have it selected. And there you have it, those were Karnok maps. Now, Karnok maps obviously can be extended some more, but as you can imagine, the more inputs you give it, the bigger that grid becomes. Unfortunately, it's not very easy to say, you know, when you're done finding groups in a Karnok map, it's not easy to be very sure that you've picked out the largest groups. And that's why when you actually encounter this in school, well, you're just gonna have to practice a lot and just be as careful as you possibly can. And that will go a long way in helping you get correct answers. But yeah, that's all there is for this Random Wednesday episode. I hope you gained some insight today. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.